A two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist and internationally best-selling author, historian H.W. Brands is renowned for his character-driven and surprising portraits of historical figures. His previous books include biographies of Ronald Reagan, Ulysses S. Grant, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Douglas MacArthur. His latest book, Our First Civil War, tells the story of the American Revolution as a violent conflict between neighbors, family members, and friends forced to choose sides between the Loyalists and Patriots. By asking how our personal experience becomes political, Brands also delves into the motivations of iconic figures like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Benedict Arnold, as well as the enslaved and indigenous people drawn into the conflict by circumstance. For today's conversation, H.W. Brands is joined by American presidential historian Alexis Coe, author of New York Times bestseller, You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington. Alexis is the host of the popular podcast, Presidents Are People Too, and No Man's Land. Hello, I'm Alexis Coe, and I am so excited to be here with H.W. Brands. I reviewed your last book last year in the Washington Post. Um, so how do you produce works in such quick succession? How did this happen? This is a book that has been sort of in my head for a long time. And this, is, this reflects the fact that I'm a teacher as well as a writer. And so I teach at the University of Texas, and I talk about things like the American Revolution, and I've talked about uh, the subjects of other books that I've written. So when I decide to write a book, it's not as though I need to educate myself to the, the story itself. I have to figure out what it is I want to tell, and more precisely, what question I want to ask and I want to answer in this story. In the case of this book, I had always been aware that the nastiest fighting in the American Revolutionary War took place between Americans. Um, it was Americans against the Americans, not Americans against the British. That was relatively civilized. But the most brutal, the nastiest fighting was between Americans and Americans. And I, I'd known this, but I didn't really put it together. And, and actually, so my previous book had been on John Brown and Abraham Lincoln and, and the coming of the Civil War. But I thought really the Civil War model was a good one for examining certain aspects of the American Revolution. And in some ways, it was... It was an even nastier civil war, because at least in the case of the American Civil War of the 1860s, that war split the country on geographic lines. And so if you were in one part of the country or the other, you knew which side of the war you were on, or at least supposed to be on. But in the case of the American Revolution, it split every community because there were those who opted for independence, the ones that called themselves patriots. And then there were the ones who maintained their loyalty to Britain, the loyalists. And this could go right down the middle of communities, go right down the middle of states. It could, could go right down the middle of families. One of the stories that I tell is of the rift in the Franklin family. Benjamin Franklin became a revolutionary and William Franklin remained a loyalist. And it, it estranged the two and they were, they were never able to reconcile. That is one of my favorite stories. When I try to describe um, how families were ripped apart, I also wrote a book on the revolution and biography of George Washington. And that story is one of the best vehicles for this description between, you know, loyalists and patriots. Can you go a little bit more into this idea of the elder founder and his son and, um, you know, sort of walk us through their rift? Well, so this is the striking thing. And, and it seems almost ironic because generally one expects the younger generation to be more the rabble rousers, the ones who reject conventional wisdom. But in Franklin's case, Franklin became a revolutionary at the age of 70, for heaven's sakes. You know, revolution is, is a young person's game, not an old folks game, but his son, William, his son, William wouldn't go along. And for Franklin, for both Franklins, for George Washington is another figure that I examine, John Adams, this question of making the leap to independence, making the leap to support for independence, this was, this was a big step. And it was a step, it was a decision that was made for political reasons, but there were personal reasons as well. When people make big decisions like this, it's never just one thing or another that causes it. It's a constellation of things. And Benjamin Franklin was perhaps the most unlikely revolutionary that one could imagine because revolutionaries almost always, 
have some particular complaint against the status quo. There's something they don't like about the status quo. Usually it hasn't served them well in some very important way to them. But with Franklin, it was a brilliant success within the status quo of the British Empire. He was born into a family of extremely modest means in Boston in the early part of the 18th century. And by the 1760s, he was one of the most famous people in the world. And he was a huge fan of the British Empire. And he thought, you know, if I can succeed in the British Empire, perhaps other people can. But there came a crucial moment. And this is where, this is where things got personal. So, so my story, the stories of all these people, it's a combination of the political and the personal, or sometimes what I call big history and little history. And big history is the history of great movements and wars and revolutions and all this. But little history is what's going on inside the heads of individuals. And Franklin was an agent of Pennsylvania and several other colonies. In London, he'd been in London for most of two decades. And this is when the controversy between the colonies and the British government was really heating up. And the latest sin committed by the colonists against British law and British property was the Boston Tea Party. And Franklin being the most visible of the American agents was held before the British Privy Council made to answer for this later crime, this act of vandalism, even terrorism as was sometimes phrased. And Franklin was made to stand before the Privy Council and the King's Solicitor General, a man named Alexander Wedderburn, and just endure this diatribe that lasted more than an hour. He was said to be a liar, a traitor, a thief, any, everything you could imagine. And Franklin realized that he was being treated this way because he was an American. He would never live up to British standards, at least in the minds of government, in the minds of the people making the decisions, because he had been born in North America. And it's an exaggeration, but not by much to say that Franklin walked into that session in the British Privy Council. This is January, 1774. He walked in an Englishman and he walked out an American. He became a revolutionary because the British would not allow him to become a full, well, citizen's not the right word, but a full member of the British empire. And, and this is sort of the framing question I put you know, what causes a, a man to forsake his country and take arms against it? This is the question I put to Franklin. It's the question I put to George Washington. You know Washington's story very well. You know? And so why did these people become revolutionaries? Why did they become rebels? But then I also look at the people who become, except I should probably say, remain loyalists. And this is, this is the thing that so galled them because they were called traitors by their former friends, by their neighbors, by people who knew them, not for any act that they had done, but because the rules had changed. They were the ones who held steadfast and all of a sudden the rules changed. And the day before they were good upstanding citizens. And now all of a sudden they're traitors. You did such a wonderful job of pinpointing the moment or the decades over which one became a reluctant revolutionary with Washington, it was similar to Franklin in that he realized he would always be a second class citizen, that he would never fully access everything. I like to say that he wanted to be at the center of his country's story. And at first that the country didn't really matter as much and it became over time to be quite significant, but he really had to get boxed in in every single way. And even as he got closer and closer to this moment, you know, I'm talking about this started in his late 20s and, you know, he's in his 40s. He's still reluctant and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't agree with the Boston Tea Party. He doesn't agree with the destruction of property. So we're talking about this divisiveness within, um, you know, families, loyalists and patriots, but also patriots and also loyalists. Yeah. So I'm really intrigued at your take on Washington because I've worked on Washington and I developed these ideas of, of what made him make this decision. And it certainly wasn't that he expected that his life would be materially any better. He had life as good as it could be in Virginia in those days. And he was very well respected, you know, one of the, the most eminent figures of Virginia. But there was just something about his sense that there were these people in London, in the circles around London, that disdained him simply for being an American. He knew that he was more qualified, for example, as a soldier than you know, nearly everybody in Braddock's army. You know, he'd, he'd gone to war with these people, side by side with these people, and it outperformed them. But he would never achieve stature in their eyes because he wasn't born in Britain. 
he had these moments where he was satisfied, where he could have just been fine. You know, when he retires from the Virginia militia, his retirement plan is Martha Washington. She's the wealthiest widow in Virginia. She has all this power and he's good. It's just that he keeps getting boxed in. He doesn't feel like he's getting a fair price on the goods that he sends over to London. You know, it's this process, the same for Jefferson, these people who have a lot to lose. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about your book, and, and you've hit on this a little bit, you've hit on the um, emotional sort of consequences of, of patriots versus loyalists within the same family and the political consequences, but there are material economic consequences as well for, for Adams, for, for Franklin, for parts of the Franklin family, certainly. And what, what did that look like? A uh, hundred years ago, there was an entire school of thought involving the American Revolution and the founding generation that so-called progressive historians put forward that said, if you really want to know what caused all this, follow the money and looked at the economic underpinnings of the demand for independence and writing the constitution. And if one wants to look for that, you can see it. So Washington wanted better terms of trade with Britain. Washington had large speculations in Western lands. And what really got his attention right away of all the things that led up to the Revolutionary War was the proclamation of 1763, which forbade settlement across the Appalachian Mountains. Now, Washington wasn't going to go move out there, but he had a lot of land and he hoped that people would go out there and buy his land. And so, and I, by the way, Franklin was speculating in Western lands as well. And James Madison, everybody was. This is just what you did if you had some spare cash lying around. And you were basically betting on the future of the country. And to some extent, this was also a feeling that there'd been a sort of bait and switch routine because Americans fought valiantly hard in the war against France that opened up that Western territory. The whole idea, at least a very large part of the idea for the Americans was that we're gonna get the French off of the frontier so we can actually go settle there. And so Americans fought and they spent a lot of money and a lot of Americans died in this war and they won. And then the fruits of victory were the British say, sorry, you can't go out there. So it was really clear at that point to Americans that the interests of Americans were not at the heart of British policy. To the extent that Americans could be useful, that was fine. But if, they had, if a decision had to be made in London between the interests of Britain back home or Britain in Europe and British Americans in America, the British Americans were always gonna get second shift. We should pause and say that when we're talking about loyalists and patriots, um, we should talk about slavery and what each side offered them during this time. Yeah, so this, this is a big part of the story. And it's a, I, again, it's another level of complication in the story because for most of the, the non-enslaved Americans, their decision to be a patriot or a loyalist is, I'm not gonna say it's entirely free, nobody makes any decision entirely free, but, but it was up to them primarily. Whereas for the slaves, they were kind of dragged into the war depending on who's, slave they were. And if you were an enslaved person whose master was a patriot, well, you could be dragged into the war. And one of the people I write about is a man named Jeffrey Brace, who was the slave of a patriot master. And his master went to war and just took him along. And Brace realized that there was a great irony in this, because by this time, the British government had offered freedom to slaves of patriot masters who would go over to the British side and fight for the British. So Brace realized, okay, I'm fighting against the people who are offering me freedom, but he wasn't in a position to act on that offer. And, and the decision to try to accept the British offer or not depended a lot on where you were and more precisely where the British army was. If the British army was five miles away, then you could make your break for it. If the British army was 500 miles away, forget it. You were on, you're gonna certainly get re-enslaved, recaptured before you got there. So Jeffrey Brace is a slave who didn't choose to fight, but his master did to choose to fight for the Patriot cause. And so Jeffrey Brace was fighting on that side. So there's another, a slave person that I look at, his name is Boston King, and he was working on a plantation as the British army got near, and he heard about this offer, 
And so he goes over to the British lines. And in their case, and in the case of Jeffrey Grace and Boston King, to a greater degree, at least maybe a different degree, than that that faced the, I'll call them the white patriots and the, the loyalists, they have to bet on, so first of all, which side's gonna win? Everybody had to bet on which side is win. You don't wanna take a losing cause. Not too many people will volunteer for something they know to be a losing cause. So you have to at least have a prospect your side's gonna win. But in the case of the slaves, there was, okay, if the British offer freedom and they win, are they gonna follow through? And if the British offer freedom and they lose, what's gonna happen then? Do I simply get returned to my former master who's probably gonna be pretty angry at all of this? And in the case of Jeffrey Brace, the one, if the, the, the Patriot owns slave, if the Patriots win, am I better, worse off than I was before? Where does that all fit? And I should add that I also tell a story as applied to the various, uh, the various Native American people. So the Indian tribes, they had to decide as well because in their cases, they were gonna to have to deal with whoever was left standing at the end of this war between the British and the Americans. And if they thought that the British were gonna win, then presumably it would behoove them to side with the British. If they thought the Americans were gonna win, then maybe the thing worked the other way. But then there was always the question of, maybe it's better actually if neither side wins because for centuries, at least for a couple of centuries since the founding of the first English and French colonies, the Indians benefited from having two powers fighting for their loyalty. And one of the reasons that the Americans were so happy at the outcome of the French and Indian War was that France was out of the picture. So now the British Americans could basically form a common front against the Indians. But then the British government stepped in and said, no, you can't do that. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, 10 years later, the British and the Americans were fighting each other. So the Indians now have to decide, do we choose the American side? Do we choose the British side? Or I suppose I should probably say, do we choose the Patriot side or the Loyalist side? Because in most cases they were dealing with groups of Americans. And the answer was that some tribes and some parts of tribes chose one way and some chose the other way. And for them, again, for those people, again, the question was not only which side's gonna win, but then are they going to fulfill their promises at the end of the war? And where are we gonna get stuck? So the, the individual I focus on there is a, a chief of the Mohawk, uh, sub entity of the Iroquois Confederacy named Joseph Brandt. And he sided with the British during the war. So he became probably the most important of the pro-British Indians. And the British end up losing the war. And Joseph Brandt, like uh, very many, maybe perhaps 100,000 loyalists, basically uh, had to flee the country. And like many of the um, American loyalists, he went to Canada. Now, in fact, his portion of the Mohawk tribe went to Canada. So Boston King, the, the loyalist slave, the slave who had left his patriot master and gone over to the British side. So we'll, we'll call him a loyalist, but he's no longer slave once he's in the British army. But the, the war ends more precisely, the fighting ends after the Battle of Yorktown. And then there's this sort of waiting period to see what's gonna come out of Paris. And Boston King winds up in New York, which had during the whole war been basically the, the epicenter of loyalism. And he's hanging around there and trying to find work and doing whatever he can. And he learns then that there has been this treaty. It was agreed upon. Of course, the news of the treaty comes in dribs and drabs. So there are these preliminary articles of peace and then the final version and all this other stuff. And a rumor starts that the British as part of the peace deal have agreed not to carry away property. Now, by property, the American negotiators included slaves. So the British have agreed not to carry away the slaves. And when the former slaves who took up the offer of freedom hear this, they panic because the British have sold us out. They're not going to provide refuge for us. And Boston King in this memoir that you wrote really describes the panic that spread through the African-American community of loyalists in New York. And every, they're all afraid they're gonna be re-enslaved and it's gonna be worse than before. But in fact, it doesn't turn out that way. The British on the ground in New York, they basically ignore that provision of the treaty and ships are provided and off they go. And so they, they try to make this new life. Well, for 
compulsory expatriates, life is often not all that good. Uh, Canada was a harder place to live than Maryland. And the, the expatriates were not, uh, the refugees were not entirely welcome again. So here's a story. Who wants the refugees of an unpopular war? The sorting out of all this stuff is, is really complicated. Now, there is one saving grace to this story. That may be more than one saving grace, but, but one aspect of this that makes it different, for example, say than the French Revolution. In the case of the French Revolution, the losers were pretty much stuck there. And it, it led to massive reprisals and killings by the many thousands. If the loyalists had had no place to go, then I think the aftermath of the American Revolution, the American Revolution would have been more revolutionary and there would have been a lot more bloodshed. So they did have this escape route, which helped a lot, but it didn't mean that they're, it meant that they were still alive. They left without their property. They left without their connection. In many cases, they left without their families. It's, I think, fair to say that in general, wars do not end well. And the American Revolution, I mean, we saw this most recently with the war in Afghanistan, but the American Revolution ended just like that. We've, uh, looking at it from the American side, we've tended to airbrush out the treatment of the loyalists. But as I say, maybe 100,000 loyalists felt obliged to flee the country, flee for their lives. They'd lost their property. They, in many cases, they really didn't have any place to go. Uh, William Franklin, for example, Benjamin Franklin's son, the loyalist, he wound up in England and he discovered that the British didn't like having him around. He was a, a reminder of an unfortunate episode in their history. So he had sort of hoped that, well, okay, I served the king well and the king will be duly grateful, but it wasn't that way at all. It was a little bit like, I, I think the, the reaction of some veterans of the Vietnam War to coming home. To, you know, we, we put our lives on the line for our country, but after the Vietnam was over, there were a whole lot of Americans who just didn't want to be reminded of the war. And the Vietnam vets were a reminder of that war. And so they were sort of blacked out, they blanked out of history. And this, the same thing happened in the case of the Loyalists. And in the case of William Franklin, it became particularly poignant because when the war was over, William Franklin was living as, I guess I'll call him an expatriate uh, in England. And he was just kind of struggling along. He had been a big man in America. He had been the governor of New Jersey and very well respected in all this. He was branded a traitor. He was thrown into jail after New Jersey declared independence. He finally fled to England. And while he was there, he discovered that his, his old friends didn't want to have anything to do with him and the government didn't want to have anything to do with him. But he gets a letter, a series of letters actually, from his son, the grandson of Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin had spent the war years in Paris negotiating on behalf of the United States government for a French alliance and then for French support. And after the war was over, Benjamin Franklin is preparing to go home. And Benjamin Franklin's grandson, William Franklin's son, Temple Franklin, is trying to get his father and his grandfather back together. They've been estranged by the war. And William Franklin has let Temple Franklin know that, yeah, he would be delighted to be able to let bygones be bygones with his father. And, and in Temple Franklin's case, it's not only so patriots and loyalists can come back together, but so his family can be reunited. And the striking thing is that Benjamin Franklin had, he had fallen out with his British friends during the war. But after the war was over, he was willing to say, okay, that's the time passed and now we can resume our friendship. And people who, that he had been bitterly opposed to during the war, he once again mends the fences with. But he doesn't want to have anything to do with William Franklin. And I should add that William Franklin was a full grown man. He was in his fifties by now. He had that Franklin independence of mind and spirit. And he thought that he had every right to his political opinions, just as his father had. But he also had the same rebellious streak toward his parent, in this case, Ben, that Benjamin Franklin had toward his parents when he was younger. And so he was just a chip off the old block in that regard. But he nonetheless says, okay, you know, let's get back together, father. And Ben Franklin won't have anything to do with it. And I don't know if you ever have this feeling when you're writing about people in the past. But for the most part, I try to keep my distance from my subjects. I don't wanna, I don't wanna get too involved. I wanna be able to you know, have a detached view and just tell the way things happen. But in this case, as William Franklin was putting out his hand to his father, I just wanted to reach out a 
across a couple of centuries and grab Ben Franklin and say, damn it, take his hand. But he wouldn't do it. And they parted and they remained estranged. And it was, it reminded me that there was something very deeply personal in this act of rebellion that Ben Franklin had made. And it was personal, but he expected to be supported by the people around him, by the people who loved him. And that's what he held against William Franklin. He didn't hold William's political views per se against him. What he held against William was what Ben Franklin took as his lack of loyalty, his betrayal of personal trust. But again, the irony here is that Ben Franklin did it to his own parents. So why should he think it would be any different? But that's just the way, that's the way humans are. We're, we're very complicated people. I would love to talk about Benedict Arnold because yeah. I love the way that you treat him. I also, I find him fascinating. He and Washington have so much in common when they're young men in the way that they find they have something to prove. They have these tempers. They're great under pressure. Things change as they get older. Benedict Arnold, pretty bitter person. Things happen to him, you know, all sorts of things. But I would love for you to talk about him. You, you, you do something that's rare. You don't present him as a one-dimensional figure. He was clearly a talented person. He was really good at war. He was brave. He knew how to organize and inspire men. He, was, he knew enough about logistics to get his columns where they needed to go when they needed to go there. I don't know that I kind of got to the heart of Benedict Arnold. It clearly was the case that he felt ill-used by the Continental Congress. He was court-martialed for something he considered to be not at all wrong. And then there's the whole question of the woman he fell in love with and married who had strong loyalist sympathies. He was also in debt, you know, so his, uh, what shall I say, turning coat and flipping from the Patriot side to the Loyalist side, from the American side to the British side, solved potentially his uh, marriage problems and solved his debt problems and maybe solved the problems of lack of respect on the part of the American political hierarchy, but it created a whole mess of other problems. And, uh, and, and he's a really good example, maybe it takes it to a, a greater degree, of the lack of respect that the loyalists received from the British. Now, he was, he was an extreme case because soldiers do not like people who turn coat. They can find them useful. So General Howe was willing to use Benedict Arnold, but he would never respect him, and he would never trust him with anything. And Arnold must have realized this. He was not an unintelligent man, but he seems to have made decisions sort of guided by emotions, guided by his feeling of the moment, rather than by any kind of sort of pole star or anything, which is, I would say, a very striking difference from Washington. Washington seems to always have his North Star, and he doesn't, doesn't share with anybody else, but you always seen that Washington is this steady guy. This is really important. You can count on Washington in a way you can't count on most other people. And it seems as though Washington is desperate for this protege, for somebody that he can kind of raise as uh, the son he never had. And I can understand Hamilton, I can understand Lafayette, but what's striking to me is how different figures Hamilton and Lafayette were from each other, but they both seem to elicit the same kind of response in Washington. And again, and Arnold a little bit too, which I think was one of the reasons that Washington was so appalled when he learned what Arnold had done. It was a little bit like Benjamin Franklin felt toward William Franklin, a personal betrayal. It wasn't just a betrayal of your country, but it was a personal betrayal. And because I think Washington didn't didn't put himself out there emotionally very often when it did happen. It was heartbreaking. As much as we decry the partisanship that we see today and the polarization, it is there from the beginning. 